Welcome to another segment of the Gay Archive Show, where we explore gay history one bar at a time. I'm your host, Art Smith, and in today's episode, we rejoin celebrity illusionist Eddie Edwards for more celebrity stories, being mistaken for Bed Midler, advice for newcomers, and more. I work a, I've worked a place for about 10, probably 10 years maybe, called um, the Tellos um, in S- Studio City. It's a very famous jazz club. It's now co-owned uh, by Michael Feinstein, who's a very dear friend of mine. Michael, it's called now Feinstein's at the Tellos. Anyone who knows Michael Feinstein knows Michael is the most amazing artist, pianist, singer, whatever. He owns the American Songbook. He's amazing. He has clubs all over. Um, And so so we were at Fatello's before uh, Michael uh, bought into Fatello's and they made made it Feinstein's at Fatello's. Well, the room is fairly small, but it's a place where every major celebrity Every major celebrity goes to see shows. It's really one of the only places. It's very intimate. The food is amazing and all that stuff. My brother and I have worked there. We're the number one show at the Tellos. We're the we have the most consistent consecutive sellouts at the Tellos than any other entertainer, celebrity, performer that has ever performed at the Tellos. And they've had some amazing names there. Anyways, so. Um, we were invited to the opening of the Tellos and it was dinner and uh, Michael was performing along with Liza Minnelli. So um, we were asked uh, to be able to uh, come to that. There was only literally like a 90 people guest list and it was a star studded evening. And of course, Liza was there. And so we had dinner with Liza and Michael and Michael's partner and um like right next to us was like Dick Van Dyke, who had seen us before. He'd seen us at the the, the Tellos. Uh, George Hamilton, Mitzi Gaynor. Oh my God, they were were all there. Anyways, so I was able to uh, finally meet Liza because I had met her once before at the Riviera Hotel when I was uh, performing um, in La Cage at the Riviera Hotel. She didn't remember me then. Um, but anyway, so I, and I, and, and we asked for a photo at that point, this was in the eighties and she just didn't want to do a photo. So finally, finally I was able to meet her and get a photo with her, which was amazing. So I would have for, you know, memories, um, for her. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of in a nutshell without going on too long, which I already have, um, about the celebrities that I've met. I know that I'm missing so many, um, but that primarily I think is, are the main ones that I have met um, that I can remember. Well, that certainly is quite a few. Um, yeah. And you and your brother started um, your careers performing in very humble circumstances in a living room in Tucson, Arizona, and eventually came to perform together again, which you are currently doing, and travel across the country performing over 100 celebrity impersonations. And you both do the, the makeup, the costuming, and the voices live. There is no lip syncing in your act whatsoever. Um, which of those celebrities are your favorites to perform? Well, I, I'm very partial to Barbra Streisand. Um, and I think one of the reasons why is because it was the one that I had to work the hardest to achieve. Um, not only the voice, but the look as well, you know. Um, and um, I worked hours and hours and, and years uh, to be able to perfect it, to get to a point where I really was happy with it. I was never really happy with, you know, my impersonations uh, the many years that I did it, everyone loved it. But to me, it was like, no, I don't look like her. No, I don't sound like her. You know, it wasn't until like the last, like, you know, probably 10 years that I really thought, okay, I 
think I am comfortable with this. I think I've actually nailed it. Um, and it's really interesting because out of all the characters that I do, um, Barbara, for whatever reason, the gay community loves my Barbara and my Bette Midler um, uh, out of all the characters. Those are the ones that for whatever reason, um, they, uh, they favor over all the rest of, rest of them that I do. Um, again, I always believe in this business when someone does, um, when someone is a celebrity impersonator and they do multiple characters, there's always one character that they happen to uh, resemble more than all the rest of them. I think Barbara for me is definitely the one because I feel Barbara. Uh, it isn't that I'm saying that I don't feel the, the rest of them because I do, but I just feel Barbara more so in my heart, deep in my heart than I ever have because she's such an icon. She's such an amazing woman. You know, she's for, she's like Cher. She's, she is for, she's for gay rights. She's against any type of prejudice towards anything. Um, not only is she a great entertainer, but she's just a lovely woman and she has great morals and she's just really amazing. So um, taking all that at heart, I think Barbara probably would be my absolute best if, of course, close to close to second would be my Bette Midler. So with over a hundred celebrities in your combined um, portfolio, is there a single celebrity that you have really wanted to portray, but somehow have never been able to perfect yet? Yes, um, it would have to be uh, Reba McIntyre. Now, I, I'm not sure if I sent a photo of me as Reba, I might have, but as you can see, if you do, as you can see, my look for Reba, I was very happy with. Um, I think I nailed the look down. The problem was I could not get her voice, could not do it. And believe it or not, for the first time regarding my character, I, I just could not get her mannerisms down because Reba doesn't really do too much, you know? And I just have a really hard time um, duplicating that. I don't know why I can't put my finger on it, but I, you know, recorded myself. I studied some of the other great Rima McIntyre impersonators out there, and there's so many of them, amazing ones. Um, but I just, you know, I, I couldn't nail it. And I thought to myself, you know, I love Reba so much. I love everything about her. I'm not going to even attempt to do it unless I can do her justice in every way that I know how. The voice, the look, the mannerisms, um, everything. So, um, you know, and believe me, oh, I tried. I tried so long and so hard to be able to get that down, but I just couldn't do it. It wasn't even the fact that I could get the twang down, her twang, that was easy. It was just, I wasn't getting the right tones. And when we do an artist, we want to sound exactly like the record. That is why a lot of people that come see the show, they think first that we're lip syncing because our voices sound so much to the original artist. But that's just the way that the show is based on. I mean, that is that is what we strive for. So, and I couldn't do that with Reba. So unfortunately, I had a canner. Well, that is definitely the sign of a true professional though. Because there are a lot of people who would take, you know, an okay version and put it on stage just to be able to have another, you know, proverbial notch in their bedpost. Yep, I do her too. But uh, that speaks a lot to your professionalism. Now, today, at this point in time, you travel extensively with your brother, um, primarily, I believe, to uh, resort communities and lounges to perform your act to a completely different audience than the, than the gay audience that you started your career with. How does that compare to your days traveling through the gay circuit and performing to gay audiences? 
Well, I'll tell you. So believe it or not, a lot of the audiences now that we perform for um, are, are, I would say 95, if not larger percent of all of them are heterosexual. Um, they're not gay. Um, they are, believe it or not, conservative. Um, and I think the reason why is because my brother and I, we, when people come see our show, they view us as a twin act or a brother act or a family act. They don't view us as a drag act. Now, I'm saying nowadays, back when we were getting started, it was a whole different other uh, thing, uh, which I won't even go into because that in itself is a whole nother uh, interview. But um, that's kind of people, conservatives can come to our show and be able to be entertained by two identical twin brothers who look and sound like male and female stars. Um, and they can be able to do it in an atmosphere where they're comfortable. Um, the audiences are amazing. Um, we get many standing ovations throughout the whole show. These people are so appreciative. They're so wonderful. The, the money is extraordinary. Um, and that, that is all the good part of it, being the fact that, you know, I mean, we work, you know, we were at Mohican Sun, which was 5,000 people. You know, we were in Singapore. We were with 5,000 people um, at the, uh, um, the place there, which was just above where Universal is. It's in the same complex. Um, so the fact is, is that we're performing for different audiences, which allow us to be able to make more money and to be able to have larger amounts of people. But I'll tell you what I do miss. I miss the fact of being on a very small stage in an intimate gay bar where you can be able to, to see the faces, you can be able to feel the energy, the love of the gay people, and you can be able to, and what, what was so wonderful for me is like when I did Bette Midler, Wind, Wind Beneath My Wings, you know, this song would touch so many gay people, especially around the AIDS time when people were dying of AIDS and all that stuff. And these people would come up to me with their dollar bills and whatever, and they would, the tears would be flowing and they would just, you could just feel the love. You could see the love. Um, and for them to be able to reach in their pocket and to be able to give you a dollar, um, to me is just absolutely amazing. That's what I miss so much because it, that is their way of showing you their love, their respect of what it is that you do for a, a, a living. You don't get that when you're working for the audiences that, that, that I work for. Um, and yes, I understand it's a completely different thing and all that stuff. And I'm sure that everyone that I perform for now loves me as much as they do, but to be able to see it and feel it and be able to touch, you know, the people's hands and be able to hug them and all that stuff, you know, um, that that's probably what it is that I miss so much about, you know, performing in gay bars can, compared to what I, uh, you know, the, the difference, the, the difference between the two. And for, for decades, um, because I was going to gay bars at the same time as you were starting your career uh, for decades, drag queens were the celebrities of the gay bars and the, and the gay community and the royalty of that group of entertainers were the people like yourself, like Charles Pierce, like Jimmy James, who did live voice and visual impersonations of celebrities that was the cream of the crop that was as big as you were going to get for entertainment that was directed at a you know primarily gay audience so it was a very big contribution on the opposite side of the stage for us to be there and have the, that powerful of a performance brought to what at that time was our little 
safe haven. It was our little place that we could be who we wanted to be, which we could not do at work. We could not do at church. We could not do at the supermarket. But when we were there, we were our authentic selves and we were seeing people who were incredibly talented performing directly to us. And in many cases, they were parts of our own community, which was even more rewarding. So I totally understand that energy that you're feeling because I've been there on the other side of the stage. Um, now, you, you still perform in gay venues occasionally, correct? Oh, yes. I mean, every, every, every chance I get, and I always will. And I got to tell you, honestly, in some cases, you know, I am actually put down by people, um, you know, uh, who basically says, why are you, why are you going backwards when, when you should, I, I said, no, no, no. I said, I'm not going backwards. I said, if anything, I'm literally going back to where I actually started. It, if it wasn't for these gay bars, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. And I, I love it. And any chance I get, you know, I, I love, love to do it because it is, it just brings me back to a time where I was starting my career and it was just, it was a whole different other world. And like I said, you just don't get that from performing in big venues and where I'm at now, you know? I mean, if I had more time to be able to do it uh, more often, I would, because I love it. And it's not going back, you know? And even though I take a huge, huge pay cut by doing it, it's not about the money at all. It's not about the money. It's about being able to kind of, for me, go back to my brothers and sisters, um, to where it all started for me. So, so that's really what it really means to me. Well, that's, that's heartwarming. Um, I interviewed, uh, Jimmy James, uh, about a month or so ago. I've known Jimmy for 30 years. I actually dug up a photograph when I met him, um, in his performance in Atlanta in 1988, I believe it was, um, with, with that was taken of, of me with Jimmy back then. And, um, he had told me in his interview that he, one of his goals was always to get a recording contract singing his own original songs in his own voice. Has that ever been something that's crossed your mind? Well, first of all, I have to say, Jimmy and I are very dear friends. I've known Jimmy forever. Jimmy started in Lacage uh, the same way that that I started in, in Lacage. We have so much in common. And um, I really, and I've talked to Jimmy about this many times. I really wish that Jimmy would have been able to get into the mainstream of where I'm at because, you know, his talent is being wasted by not being able to go and to be able to perform for the people that I perform for. And I mean, you know, the conservatives and, you know, the, the, the big venues and all this stuff. And I'm not saying that he doesn't do that with the gay community, but I'm saying that he should, that he really honestly should have been able to cross over the way that, um, you know, Jim Bailey did and uh, Charles Pierce did where they were, you know, working those huge arenas to, you know, the, straight community and all that stuff. Um, there is nobody in the world like Jimmy James. I mean, nobody, not Charles Pierce, not Jim Bailey. And the only reason why that I say that is because um, Jimmy does multiple characters. He's like us. He does multiple characters and every single character is just as good as all the rest of them that he does. And again, as I said, he was always the Marilyn Monroe. That was what everyone, you know, if you were to, to think who was the best Marilyn Monroe sounded like in the world, it would be Jimmy James. 
Um, but I have so much respect for, for Jimmy. I love him so much. We talk, you know, whenever we can, because, you know, we're both so busy with our, you know, schedules, but his, I'm, I'm telling you, and it just, it really hurts me so much. And I've told him this, that he, that he didn't get bigger than what he should have, that he should have been. He should have been where Jim Bailey is, where Charles Pierce is. And I'm not saying that he's not, I'm just saying that he wasn't able to hit the mainstream of the, you know, community where he was on the Tonight Show. He was on, you know, Jay Leno. He was on, you know, um, uh, Jimmy Fallon, you know, all that stuff. Because I think if there was a way of presenting him to that community, they would eat him up because he's just so talented. So again, um, I, I can't say enough about uh, Jimmy. They, they don't make them like Jimmy James anymore. And I doubt very seriously if there'll ever be anyone else on this earth like uh, Jimmy James. He's just, he's extraordinary and I just love him, love him to death. Um, in regards to your question, no, I never wanted to be able to sing in my regular voice. I know where my talent is. And my talent is in performing as female celebrities. That is what I was meant to do. That's what I've been doing. You know, the old saying is, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. And, um, you know, um, when, I was, when I was young, um, I wanted to be an actor. And I even, believe it or not, I even gave up doing this for a while to be able to become a television actor. Um, I was in, um, I was in uh, An Evening at La Cage in uh, Las Vegas in the early 80s, uh, performing with Frank Marino. We were doing uh, um, three shows a night, six nights a week. Um, we were sold out every single night at the famous Riviera Hotel. And I did that for about four years. And then I just thought, you know, I, I, I want to become a, a TV actor. That has always been my dream. So what did I do? I left um, La Vegas, La Cage. I went to the American Academy of the Dramatic Arts. I was accepted there to be able to, you know, um, start my acting career. And, you know, once I started doing that, I realized that, you know what? I know where my talent was. You know, my counselors um, at the uh, American Academy had said, why are you doing this? You know, um, you have what every single person is going to school here. Uh, you had that already. You have the opportunity to be able to travel all over doing what it is that you love to do as your celebrity characters. Why are you wanting to become an actor? You know, and, you know, it took me a while, but then I realized, you know what? I'm never going to make it as, as myself, as Eddie Edwards, as an actor. That's not what I was put on this earth to do. I was put on this earth to be able to put on makeup, put on a wig, put on a dress, go out there and be a star, you know, that, that way. Um, so that was when I decided I know, know exactly what it is um, that I want to do. Um, and I'm not going to even attempt to be able to do anything as myself because um, it just it's just not going to be successful for me as what I'm doing now. And on, on some level, you actually have been using those acting talents because every impersonation that you do is a form of acting. You're learning mannerisms, gestures, you know, uh, some kind of movements, uh, facial expressions, and technically scripts, the lyrics are all a form of a musical script that you are performing every time. So in reality, you are fulfilling that desire to be an actor, but you're not the actor, Eddie Edwards, you're the actor, you know, Cher or Bette Midler or whoever, Barbara Streisand. Um, now, I also have interviewed Chad Michaels and uh, Jimmy James, and they both told me stories where 
photographs of them in their character personas have been inadvertently published or used as actual celebrity images. Uh, possibly the most interesting to me, one to me was that uh, Jimmy James, one of his uh, headshots was used by an African nation on the celebrity series of postage stamps and as Marilyn Monroe. Um, but Chad Michaels also told me that he's had photographs published in magazines or newspapers that identified the image in the picture as being Cher. Um, has, that, has that happened to you? Yes, it, it, it has. But let me just basically say, isn't that absolutely amazing? I mean, what artist do you know that can be able to say that you were actually mistaken uh, and they actually put it into print? I mean, that is that is such an honor. And it, it doesn't surprise me. I mean, please. I mean, I I had Chad Michaels in my legendary D diva show. And I'm telling you, I was literally this close to him. And as you know, like I said, I know Cher like nobody knows Cher. I mean, I've been up close to her or whatever. When I tell you, there's no di there is no difference. There is no difference. It is like uncanny. It's like, you know, I always say, you know, I, I always tell him, you know what? After seeing you, I don't ever want to perform a share again because he is just so extraordinary. But, you know, it doesn't it doesn't su surprise me. But what an um, amazing honor. Same thing with 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 Jimmy. Oh, my God. I mean. His Marilyn Monroe is just, I mean, beyond anything I could ever say. And I did not know that story about the uh, the stamps. That's incredible. I, that's um, um, amazing. Um, you know, regarding your, you know, your your question, yes, that that has happened to me. Uh, one one of the instances is that um, I do a lot of work in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, we were there. Uh, for about four years in this very famous area called Federal Hill. Um, it's all, at that time, it was all ran by the mob and we were hired by the mob to be able to perform at this amazing place called um, Ro the, the, the Aroma. Uh, we sold out every night. It was dinner and all at that time coming, you know, to see us and all that stuff. Well, the Providence Journal, which was at, at that time, still is, but at that time it was like the New York Times, you know, whatever, you know, huge and all that stuff. Well, they printed in that, in the particular, um, it was like the, the weekend section was the, the pull out, the real thick pull out that every, everybody read. Um, something about, you know, Bette Midler backstage getting ready for her millennial show or whatever. And there's a photo of me backstage putting on my makeup as Bette Midler. Now, I gotta tell you, first of all, I don't look one thing like Bette Midler. I don't know why they did it. It was a bad photo, but for whatever reason they did it and everyone thought that it was Bette Midler. So, I mean, I was, I was honored. Did I think I looked like Bette Midler? No, not at all. But I was, I was very, very, very honored to you know, do that. I also think too, there were several different times on the internet where I, people had sent me photos uh, mistaking uh, me as Barbara Streisand. That's happened you know, a, a, a few times as well. But you know, I mean, anything, anytime anything happens about that, it just makes me feel good because it, it makes me know that I'm doing my craft and I'm doing it well and I'm fooling the people. And to me, when you do what I do, if you can fool the people and totally make them believe that you are someone that you're not, to me, there isn't any bigger of a charge than what I get when I achieve that. Now, I know you said that, uh, particularly in that Bed Midler photograph, that you don't, in that particular photograph, necessarily see the resemblance, but I think a lot of times we're our own worst critics. You know, we're the ones who criticize us ourselves the most. And um, I've seen the photograph and I can easily see how somebody would say, yeah, that could be bad. You know, that's, you know, so especially in that day that I think that was like 20 years ago when that happened. So 
you know, technology of um, photo imagery and everything has changed a lot in those years. Newspaper print 20 years ago was not, um, you know, the highest quality that you would frame on your wall because that's just the way it was. Um, now we've seen countless performances and videos online of your celebrity impersonations over the decades, but each and every one of them are characters. What is the real Eddie Edwards like? Well, I'll tell you, um, as I said before, um, I'm a very spiritual person. Um, I, um, I, 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 I spend a lot of my time listening to uh, Dr. Wayne Dyer, who is like a spiritual uh, teacher who I absolutely uh, love and adore. Um, and um, it's just, you know, the philosophy of his is basically you create your own reality. Um, and, um, you know, if you basically, you know, meditate and if you are a good person and if you treat people the way that you want to be treated, you know, and be kind and be loving and um, help people along the way. And, um, um, you know, I mean, that's everything as myself, as, Ed, as Eddie Edwards, um, as I am as, you know, a person. I Listen, I, I am, I don't take my celebrity uh, image uh, to heart at all. Uh, I'm not. I'm not going to tell you that I don't have an ego. I have the biggest ego in 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 the world, you know. But I don't take it seriously. Um, this just happens to be a journey for me um, that I have created myself. Um, I can never take myself seriously because I know it can be taken away uh, from me like that. Um, and I've seen it happen. Um, I believe I try to help everybody that I can um, in any way I can, because, you know, um, I, I have had such an amazing career. I've been so blessed. Um, I, 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 like I said, as I said, this is like a dream I never imagined to have been able to cre create all this. But I also think too, that you as a celebrity, you have to be able to help other people. You have to be a role model. Uh, you have to be kind. You have to be loving. Don't be jealous of anybody who does your character. Don't be jealous of anyone who does what it is that you do for a living because every single one of us is different. And none of us is taking work away from anybody else. If anything, we're creating more opportunity for everyone else to be able to have work out there. Because the more that we do what it is that we love to do, it's gonna open up doors for everyone else, including those people that are very young, who's gonna be able to be doing this you know, in the next 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, we are our own map makers. We are the ones that create everything that we want to create. Um, you know, I, I don't like drama. drama. Drama makes my heart hurt. Drama makes my head spin. It gives me a headache. It makes me sick. Anytime that I am, you know, seeing drama, hearing drama or whatever, I physically get ill. So I want to be able to feel good. I want to be able to feel God. I want to be able to, to be happy. Life is way too short. I want to be able to be on my deathbed and to be able to say, you know what? Thank you, God, for everything that I've had in this life, for everything I've been able to buy, everything I've been able to create, everything, everything. And I don't want to be able to get to be on my deathbed and say, I live my life as a lie. I was, I just was not able to do anything that I wanted to do. You know, there was so much more that I wanted to create. Um, and so I put, um, I put a lot of energy when I'm not performing into uh, spirit, spirituality. I also uh, spend a lot of time uh, learning about the microbiome, uh, gut health, uh, eating right, uh, staying away from sugar, um, you know, um, all the bad stuff that, you know, 
uh, we as individuals put in our body that poisons our body, that causes inflammation and all that stuff. I really educate myself, you know, on, on all that. I'm not saying that I don't cheat. I mean, I do have one cheat day that I'm able to, you know, eat what it is that I want, but I try to eat clean and healthy throughout my whole, um, you know, um, uh, life because I want to stay thin. I want to stay pretty because these celebrities that I'm performing for, damn, they look good. And if you are an entertainer, you have the responsibility to be able to keep yourself in shape, keep yourself looking good, do whatever you need to do, rather it's Botox or whatever it is to be able to keep yourself looking great, both physically and mentally and spiritually so that when you go on stage, you can be able to give the very best that you can when you're on stage and look great. And so as Eddie Edwards, I spend all that time when I'm not working, trying to make myself better, trying to be loving, trying to help people um, watching Netflix, keeping yourself busy, putting good things in your mind um, to be able to just keep yourself happy and healthy. You mentioned, um, you know, the performers, the next generation that's coming up, that's going to be performing us, performing for us for the next, you know, 30 or 40 years. What advice do you have for that new generation of uh, gender bending performers? Be yourself. Um, God has given you everything that you need to be able to live your life and to be able to take your journey. Um, yes, it's important to work hard. Um, you have the foundation, but you have to work. You have to work your ass off. You have to pay your dues over and over and over and over again until you finally get to a point where you've made it. And then what happens? Then you've got to be able to do it all over again. And you've got to be able to um, uh, uh, pay your dues again, again. It's backwards, it's backwards, it's forward. But it's all a learning process. And don't, the most important thing, don't get bitter along the way. Don't get caught up in drama. Don't get caught up in, in hateful, hatefulness. Don't get caught up in jealousy. Be loving, be compassionate, be com compassionate. You don't know what these people that you're fighting with or whatever are going through in their minds, in their own personal life. You don't know what they're going through. So be a loving person, um, be willing to work hard. Um, and most of all, um, don't expect it to just come to you because it's not gonna happen. Um, get yourself out there, be creative. You young people, you have something that we never had, the internet, social media, all that stuff that can be able to make people celebrities now that we never had when we were younger. So use that to your best to be able to create your image, to be able to get your, um, your image out there, whatever it is that you happen to offer. If putting on a wig and makeup and creating your own personality is what you do, do it the very best best that you can go out there and make people happy because what's going to happen is that when you're done with this life what you're going to carry on with you after this life is all of the joy all of the kindness and everything that you've done for humanity that's what's going to follow you not the hatefulness not the bitterness not you know, putting people down, fighting with people, um, all, all, all that stuff. So just most of all, just be a very kind person, work hard and do what it is that you love to do. That is some great advice. And hopefully it will help some of the younger people as they move forward in their careers. So 
I am going to put you a little bit on the spot now. Okay. If you could go back in time and revisit one gay bar that no longer exists, which one would it be and why? Um, well, I honestly have to believe, I mean, I honestly believe that it would have to be Studio One in Hollywood. There, there was nothing like that. Nothing like that. I mean, you had so many, it was, it was, it was kind of like Studio 54 in its own type of format. Um, it was amazing. The music was unbelievable. The DJs were incredible. You had the rose tattoo underneath that had the most amazing talent, um, incredible shows, um, amazing food. Um, I mean, everything. It had everything. It had absolutely everything. The location, you couldn't beat it. It was amazing. Um, you know, it was, there were, you know, you could go there, you could dance, you could go, you know, crazy, you could enjoy yourself, you could go see a show. And then afterwards, you could just walk across the street to the mother load, uh, which was a cruising bar, and you could pick up your trade for the night. And I mean, what, 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 what better? It was just, it had, it had absolutely everything. It was where I spent my, you know, early, early life. Um, I met so many amazing people, so many upcoming stars uh, that was at uh, Studio One. It was just, it was just incredible. Scott Forbes was ahead of his time. I mean, he did such an amazing, uh, amazing, amazing um, thing. I mean, he was just, he was, he was, in, he was incredible and he brought so much joy to so many people. And um, it was that, that, that probably was my, my favorite place. I am absolutely not surprised at that answer. Um, particularly because you had mentioned studio one before and also because in the course of my research, um, I have stumbled across a number of social media groups and online articles and things praising Studio One and talking about how fabulous it was. So it does not at all surprise me that you said that. Um, and it certainly had a much longer lifespan than Studio 54. I mean, most people don't realize Studio 54 was a flash in the pan. You know, it was yes. closed be almost before it opened. It was like, you know, but it somehow made an indelible mark. Uh, but Studio One was very much like that on the West Coast, too. And, and I'm glad you did mention that because that will bring a little bit more attention to, you know, the evolution of the gay scene on the West Coast, which was equally as abundant and energetic as it was on the East Coast. So is there is there anything else that you want to talk about? Uh, you know, I just, um, you know, I just want to be able to let all of those people know that are the, the, the younger generation, you know, um, I'm, I'm 50, 57 years old. I was born in 1965 and I have seen the drag world, um, change in so many directions. And I mean, for, for the, for the good, for the good. Um, and, you know, when I started in this business and my brother and I were first, you know, trying to get into the mainstream of it, we were shunned by, um, you know, um, theaters uh, and venues and restaurants. And we were, you know, we were, we were thrown out of major hotels um, after having standing ovations. Um, and, um, you know, I went through a lot of, um, you know, um, prejudice and, um, you know, and, and it, it was just, it was, but it allowed me to appreciate what it is that I have now. You know, the world is a different place now because of RuPaul's drag race. Um, and, you know, you talk to, you know, different people and that are in the business that are, you know, of my gener generation. 
and, you know, others, whatever. And a lot of people, you know, have their own feeling about it. Some people like the RuPaul drag race, some people don't. But I think that whatever it is that your feeling is about it, is that if you happen to look back to when I got started, my God, we have come such a long way in the drag world. I mean, to be able to think in the 80s, when I, you know, in the late 70s, early 80s, when I got started, that you would have a drag queen by the name of RuPaul accepting Emmys, Emmys for his performance in what it is that he does. Where back then, nobody would even care about drag queens or anything like that. So to me, I just think, you know, we've gotten so much awareness and people just look at it now, you know, so much differently than it did, you know, back then. And we are just so much more accepted. So I think this is something we need to embrace. And, 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 you know, you cannot put a definition on drag. You can't because it has a million different meaning, meanings to so many different people. It's just a different form of it. So all of those people out there that are, you know, doing it or whatever, you know, why don't we all just embrace everybody? Why don't we all love everybody, accept everybody for whatever form of drag that they do and, and, and realize that it's entertainment, it's expression, it is, um, you know, people being able to show their talent in, in, in so many different ways. It's something that needs to be celebrated. It isn't something that needs to be able to be pointed at and judged at and, and ripped apart or diagnosed or, you know, um, because there are no rules in drag. There are no rules in drag. Let's all accept each other's form of of drag in whatever it is that they do and embrace it and be loving towards each other and be helpful in any way that we can towards other people. Listen, we have come a long ways and it's basically because all of those people, many of them like Kenny Sasha and um, Logan, Logan Carter and um, Jimmy James. Uh, well, Jimmy James, of course, is still w w with us, but all those people um, that have passed on, uh, that have paved the way for us, Kenny Kerr, um, all of them, those are the people that we need to be able to learn about, educate ourselves, know the history of drag, where we have come from and where we are going to. And that's why I want everyone to educate themselves, go on YouTube and to be able to see all those people that have paved, paved the way of um, the world as is now. You know, we have two people that have been, um, that have paved the way for us here in Las Vegas. And that's Kenny Kerr, who had a show on the strip for many, 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 many years. And then we have Frank Marino. Those two people paved the way for all of us who are working in Las Vegas now and have been able to perform on the strip. Those are people that need to be celebrated. They're not people that need to be put down or whatever, for whatever it is that they've done in their life. It's their journey, uh, whatever it is. You know, um, don't, don't, um, do not hate because you don't understand what it is they, uh, they do, or you, or you hear a rumor or whatever. Look at them and celebrate the life that they had and what they did for us as um, drag queens, celebrity illusionists, celebrity impersonators, uh, transgender, whatever you are. That's what needs to be celebrated because those are the people that have allowed us to be accepted today by the people that um, never did ex ex accept us, you know, back back when. Well, thank you so much for that uh, that advice, and and you know, I can tell by your enthusiasm. That's not just a canned speech that you know you give because it's the politically correct thing to say. Just like in your 
in your artwork, in your, uh, in your performances, you can, you can feel the passion in that statement. And I, you know, I appreciate you adding that in because it's not something I would have known to, you know, to ask you for. Um, I really appreciate you taking your time to, to do this interview with me and to share your memories and your feelings and tell us a little bit more about the journey that you've gone through, because it's very easy to look up uh, on stage or on a video and say, you know, oh, look, that person, they're lucky they got here, you know, look at him. He's, they're paying him tens of thousands of dollars for doing what the local drag queen does or whatever. And they don't understand the whole journey and the whole struggle and how much it means. So I really appreciate you taking the time to do it. And I know you have a very demanding schedule. I think uh, you told me that you perform uh, 250 shows a year, which is more days or more shows than most people ever work days. You know, it's, that's a lot of, um, of shows. So you're not just one of those slackers that goes back and said, Hey, I'll do, you know, six performances a year and I can live nicely. So it's, it's nice to know that you're that committed to it and that you, uh, and you continue to, you know, have that energy and that enthusiasm. Well, well, Art, I want to thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this. I mean, what you're doing with this uh, Barchives is wonderful. What an amazing concept. And um, I'm all for education and being able to have this on the internet for life so that, you know, years down the line, you know, people can be able to know, you know, what it was, you know, back in the, you know, heyday and get it firsthand, first experience, uh, instead of listening to rumors or maybe things that are printed that isn't necessarily quite right. You know, this is like literally from the horse's mouth. Um, so what you're doing is absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for giving me the time to be able to tell my, you know, little story. And I hope you have the opportunity to be able to find other people to where people can be able to be educated about this particular topic. Well, thank you. And that concludes another segment of the Gay Archives podcast. You can find more podcasts at gaybarchives.com slash podcast. We also have more information about this podcast and links to the other podcasts we have completed. We hope you enjoy your trip down memory lane.